What is up, everybody? I am Ralph Sutton, and you're listening to Brutally Delicious with Bruce Moore. Put down that fork. Thanks for joining me. Sorry about the mess up. My... Oh, please. It's fine. The technology these days is what it is. It's, it's crazy because uh, I, we rely on it so much. And then I have days where I had a whole day of podcasting because we do it once a month usually. And uh, I, had a whole oh, day wow. I had a whole day of podcasting like about a month ago. And we had that ripping storm that came through and took out all the Internet and the power. And I just had to cancel everything because, uh, you know, we're at the mercy of Comcast or whoever yeah, you have. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, anyway, it is, it is a crazy time that we. Yeah, that is weird. But we're we're so reliant on it now, right? More so now than than ever i think well the good news is that most of what you and i do uh would never be possible a decade two decades ago so i even look at like when i started radio i i was the uh when i started my radio show i came in they told me if you could get like sweepers and bumpers made and blah 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 then we could talk about it and they were this archaic radio station that was still using reel to reel to edit calls and stuff. Right. And I was a computer guy. So I came in with like 50 sweepers because I just taught myself audio editing on Adobe Audition, which was in its you know infancy at the time. Right. But they're like, how the fuck did you do this? <laughs> like, why? Well, it's not that difficult. They just thought, you know, you didn't, you know, you didn't lease production time. You didn't do that. How did the fuck did you do it? I just figured it out on a computer. Right. So that's what's great about technology. It opens the world up to everybody. Yeah, you're right. It's fair playing field. I guess that's a, a fair point. Anyway, how are you, man? You, you're up to so many things all at once. How do you keep up with uh, everything and keep your focus? Uh, you know, what's funny is that, um, well, you, unfortunately, we're cutting out. I think that your, your video is cutting out a little bit. Can you see me still? Yeah, perfect. Uh, your video went out for a second. Okay, no worries. Um, well, what I do, honestly, it sounds so goofy, but I've been doing this for most of my adult life the first thing i do in the morning is i rewrite my to-do list in the order that i feel i can get it accomplished meaning like there are certain things that have been on there for an <laughs> awfully long time right but it's still on my to-do list so that eventually it gets to a point where i'm sick i get sick of looking at it so i'll get that done you know but um by rewriting it i feel especially as an older dude the tactile thing of writing it sear, sears it into your brain and that's how I ha- every single morning. It's the first thing I do is I rewrite my to-do list. So you're a list guy. Let me ask you a question and be honest. Do you ever put something on your list mm-hmm. that you've already done so you can cross it off? Ha! No, I've never done that. Not intentionally. <laughs> there's, there's been a couple, like I just saw, I have a, like a t- for the network, I have like this master list of Ralph's problems with the network. And I, I did put like two or three things on the list. When I came into the studio this morning, uh, I saw that they had been done, but it wasn't intentional. Like somebody actually just did them without me telling them, which is very rare. Because to me, like a list is sort of a, not only a reminder, but a sense of accomplishment for the day. And I'll be honest, I have put some stuff on there that I've done just to cross it off. So at the end of the day, I can go, shit, look at all I've done. And that sounds weird maybe, but it is what it is. Yeah, there is it's part of game theory, you know, in that the, those those medals or those accomplishments, they help us to give us a little endorphin rush that crossing off something on a list or the like on a Facebook post, whatever it is, or the the retweets, all that is an endorphin rush. So by being able to cross something off your your list, it makes you feel better. There was that story. It was in uh, the book uh, Freakonomics where a guy would just take a, a, pe- a pebble and move it from one jar to another when he made a sales call and the thought of getting all those pebbles from a to b by the end of the day became a game to him and he became the number one salesman in the office just for that stupid little tweak <laughs> that's really interesting so how do you go about like prepping for all these shows because i mean i'm looking at all the the good sugar podcasts the sex drugs and rock and roll on top of being you know part the head of the network there how do you keep up with all that is besides your lists and all that stuff and getting up in the morning and prioritizing you've got to be extremely focused right well i yeah i think sorry is that i would have made a big difference i think this year uh COVID helped a lot and i think that helped a lot of people could look at it as some people went the path of well now's the time to do every drug on the planet and not worry about life 
And I took it as, okay, now's the time that I can just focus on things that I want to focus on because the offices had to be closed down, whatever it was. So I could start just really uh, cutting out the clutter, you know? So I started to do things for me. I lost 60 pounds. I ran, I run 25 miles a week. I work out three days a week, which I never was doing before. And um, it allowed me to start setting up routines to further instill good habits. There's a great book I recommend called Atomic Habits, where if you're st- basically the concept is if you're already doing something, like you know, every morning you start with a cup of coffee, you make yourself a cup of coffee, right. you, you know, you're doing that anyway. So if you tag into, okay, when I drink that cup of coffee, I'm going to prep my show. Then it becomes eventually instinctual when you drink the coffee, you prep the show. So you knock two things off in a way because one of them you're doing already anyway and you just kind of pair them up so that's how I do like I know I have to do a minimum of three episodes a week for myself that's a minimum which is two SDRs one good sugar all right and I have a calendar I'm booked out for at least a month in advance at all any given time and I know okay I got to prep these three shows ideally I prep all three of them on a Monday and then I don't have to think about it again for the rest of the week because those shows are done it takes a few hours for each one. If I could bang out all three on Monday, perfect. If not, I still have the rest of the week to get at least, you know, only get one of them done. I have the rest of the week. Tonight we're taping with um, the Broken Lizard guys. You know, um, they did uh, Beer Fest and they did uh, a couple other great movies and they have Tacoma FD right now. Mm-hmm. So I did that prep work, all their prep work Monday, along with the two other shows that are on this week. And then today I just looked at it and said, okay, read everything I wrote put it in the order that made sense for me that I think will be a great path for the show and I'm done. So it's not, it only seems overwhelming unless you kind of like organize it. And by the way, I was listening to your recent episode with the band Tempt and I think they're going to be on my show in a month. I, there's like a cool young band that's doing like yes. 80s rock vibes. I give them credit. Very Def Leppard ish. Very. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, but not, but yeah, it's, it's really good. And I like it because it's fun rock and roll and it's not, you don't really have to think about anything. It can take you away from all this nonsense that we're in. Like the age, I mean, I don't know. Right. I don't know where you're at, but you know, my age group, I grew up in the eighties and that's what music was about. Nothing but a good time to quote poison or whatever. So yeah, that's, you know, it's an escape and I yeah, love it. Yeah, of course. And it's very yeah, well I think produced. we're roughly the same age. Yeah. I'm, yeah we're roughly the same age. So. Yeah. So I graduated high school in like 1985. So uh, mine is 87. Okay. Yeah. So right about the same time. So you grew up with the sunset strip and all that big, well-produced fun oh, stuff. Yeah. So I had a radio show that was on about a hundred stations called the tour bus. I did that for 18 years and that was from 1999 to about 2015 or so 16, something like that. And all of that was just paying homage to all that great rock and roll stuff. You know, that, that, yeah. that guns and roses, poison etc yep hey you, you grew up in new york yeah brooklyn and then okay. moved to manhattan when i graduated so i grew up in uh, valley stream long island and uh so did you listen to wsou then the pirate radio because that's all we had back then yeah wsou i was on wdha um i used to go to the spit and hot rocks yes. and uh all those clubs out in long island yep. yeah i was a big fan of all that stuff i saw extreme perform at hot rocks they did like an acoustic set there. And I'll never forget, as I was walking in, Steve Vai was walking out. I don't know why he was there. And I gave him a high five. And it was like a highlight of my <laughs> life when I was 18 years old. So did you grow up going to Lemoore then? Yeah, I actually ran a rock. I ran Lemoore for a while. Oh, wow. Uh, the one in Brooklyn. Yeah. And I had a rock club that I did called, um, it was called Christopher's, which was in Brooklyn every Thursday night. I did for a while. I had a com- My company was called Monkey Business. And we did... Thursdays at a place called Christopher's, Fridays at Lemoore, Saturdays were World Stage Upstate, and then Sundays was Limelight, and I was the yeah. promoter and DJ at those four clubs uh, for a very ah, long time. Interesting. So we've crossed paths because I grew up at Lemoore. That was the, you know, seeing Overkill when they were nobody and, and Anthrax. They were like right. almost weekly bands. Even yeah, I saw even Warlock's, Carnivore. Warlock's first show. Warlock's oh, really? first show in America I saw at, um, at Lemoore. Wow. Crazy. I know I'm taking you down a long road, but I like to talk, so. That's fine. I saw that we also have another thing in common besides rock is uh, we're both food people. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, you're, I went to cooking school for a year and I ran a restaurant for four years. Wow. You've, uh, you're around. Yeah, I haven't gone that far. I've done a couple of cookbooks with recipes from musicians or whatever. And I'm a hack in the kitchen, no formal training. But sometimes that's the best, right? Self-taught. No, I agree. Yeah, I actually had a show for the Food Network. We only shot the pilot, but we did get like very close to being greenlit on the on the Food Network. And it was called um, Recipes That Rock, where oh, wow. I went to a, a rock star's house and we cooked their favorite meal. And then the fans of that band got to watch them play live and then eat the meal. That's beautiful. So it was like they'd eat like I, we, we shot one with Corey Glover of Living Color and he yeah. made it like his macaroni and cheese. And then we went and they did an acoustic set while their fans were eating macaroni and cheese. It was really it was a fun episode. The, the tagline was uh, food never sounded so good. And it was oh, uh, great. great. And then instead of us, they took Ace of Cakes, those motherfuckers. <laughs> I, I don't know if you've seen it, but I have a prior to the COVID, I had people come when they came to Richmond, they would just stop their tour buses here and then cook their favorite recipe in my kitchen. And we would just talk about, you know, with the new album, the tour or whatever. So we've had a That's whole bunch cool. of people That's in here great. just, you know, cooking grandma's lima bean stew while we're talking about the new record in my kitchen. And it was kind of fun, but COVID, you know, fucked everything up. So, so here yeah, we are. COVID definitely fucked everything up. How do you, uh, do you guys go in with, to the SDR with a sort of theme? Because I kind of just listened to the the one with the bee beards that Jamie sent over. And man, I was laughing my ass off. But is that like sort of a plan? Which theme? one? The uh, beard. Which one? The bee beards. Hold bee on. Bee beards. Yeah. Is there, I just listen. I'm trying to think what that is. Didn't I just listen to an episode where the guy, the uh, exposure therapy, and then he had the bees on his on his face? Oh, we didn't know. We didn't do. We were talking about it, but we didn't do that. No, we were talking to somebody about that. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. We hadn't done it, right? You're yeah. right, but it was a, an exposure kind of thing, right? Where they were exposed to snakes or whatever. Not on the show, but that's yeah, what the topic yeah, was, right? was. Yeah, yeah. That had right. me laughing hysterically. Is I that like? About that. No, that's fine. Do you guys have a like a theme when you go in, or a, a plan, or is it kind of? Well, my biggest, the biggest plan I have on SDR is that I try to, I, and I hate, it sounds so hacky when I say this, but he, there's a reason why when you, let's say you said you were going to be a chef, right? No one will say to you, oh, like Gordon Ramsay. They'll just say, oh, cool. Right. And if you say you're going to be a director, they don't say like, oh, Quentin Tarantino. They just say, cool. But if you say you're going to do a radio show or a podcast and there's going to be hot girls and there's going to be rock and roll and blah, 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 people will say, oh, like Howard, Howard Stern, Stern, right? right? So that is an evident of how omnipresent that man has been, right? right? And so that just is what it is. So I, what I always loved about it growing up was that you never knew what you were going to get. Is it going to be a band playing live? Is it going to be something really funny? Is it going to be girls doing something crazy? Is it going to be a really serious interview? You knew you'd enjoy it, but you didn't know what was going to happen, right? So I purposefully try to not book too many like-kind guests in a row. So we might do two rock stars, a week A, week B, then two comics, show A, show B, then two like funny shows or two sexy shows. I don't try to be too much of any one thing. That's the only real plan, right? Other than that, you do your research, you kind of map out how the show's going to go, but you never, I find that you shouldn't plan too much. The, the analogy I've given so many times is that people don't listen to their interviewee. They mm -hmm. just have their questions set up and they don't even let you breathe. So I try to, yeah, I have some things I'd love to do, but maybe we don't go there. Maybe they give you gold and you're going off in a different direction. Right. So I think in the past, yeah, I've done interviews for magazines and for other things and I've probably been guilty of that because you want to, you've prepped all week and you've got these questions. And I think as a young mm -hmm. interviewer or whatever, or a novice, maybe not young, but you know, I've got to get this shit in. Or I've got to ask this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. But you're right. If you just kind of play off each other, sometimes you end up down a road you never even thought you'd be. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what I never, the analogy I give, I don't want to say the person, but I was listening to someone do an interview and I was on the radio on the way home with someone I really wanted to hear. And he asked an opening question and the interviewee gave a very funny sexual response where he was showing... <laughs> Let's have fun, right? right? And then the, the interviewer's response was, oh, okay, so who produced, like, straight, like, didn't even acknowledge it because he had his list of questions and that was it. I was like, what are you doing? The guy wants to have fun with you and you're basically shooting him down. 
and that's sort of a an odd thing too, right? Because you have to be able to read them, and I'm sure you're you're probably better at it than I am. But because there are some people that are just straight business, right? I'm sure you came across it that just right. want to get their not get their stuff out and be done, and don't want to goof or have a good time. Right, I, I agree. And then the other thing is, you you know, you never know really unless you've known the person already or you've interviewed right. them before. There's no way to know. And even with people that maybe you've interviewed before, they might just be having a bad day so you have to kind of figure it out while you're going they're like there are some times where i have questions i'm like ah uh, i'll ask this question if he's in a good mood or if it seems like he wants to have fun i don't want to i can't start with that question like things like that or, or you know you you figure it out or else you're going to start off on a bad note so it is a lot of ebb and flow while you're going to try and figure out what you can get away with right what do you have plans or what is what is in your next to do you have other things well, going right now in- so um for for you know it's different things for different, like right now sdr has a pretty full calendar till uh the end of october so like uh, as i said tonight the um we're doing the a live episode i don't know when this comes out so i apologize not to pull back no, the fourth wall too much but the um the broken lizard guys and then we have carrot top on which is going to be fun Toad the Wet Sprocket's coming in. Ron Funches is coming in. Robbie Krieger from The Doors. Like a really oh, wow. good lineup. Right. And then we're doing a, an OnlyFans night where we're going to judge OnlyFans girls to see who is the best at getting guys to think that they like her, which is funny. Right. Um, we do dumb shit like that every once in a while. And then on Good Sugar, we have uh, four different, like, we, do, we don't do as many interviews on Good Sugar, but we have a couple of different people that are a yoga expert, a health expert. And because a lot of Good Sugar is about me trying to become a better person and to become healthier and to become uh, happier. It's that, that's the focus of Good Sugar. So those, those things are kind of like always happening, right? Gas Digital, which is our network, I just announced this. We um, are launching a new show with Zach Wild. He's going to be doing a podcast oh, on nice. the network, which I'm really thrilled. He, we just had a great episode that came out a couple of days ago. It was me and my co-host, Big J. Okerson, with Zach Wild and JD from Black Label and then Carmine Apice from... Rod Stewart, Vanilla Fudge, Fudge right. Cactus, all yeah, all in the studio together. It was a really, really fun episode. And on that episode, we announced that Zach's going to be doing a podcast on my network, which is called Gas Digital. We have about 21 shows, get a few million listeners a week across the network. And that takes up the bulk of my time, you know, trying to make sure that all 21 shows are always happy, you know? Right. So let me get back to Good Sugar real quick. Um did you ever imagine that you'd be on that sort of journey? I know you said the pandemic sort of set that off. Did you ever imagine you'd be? Yeah, it's funny. I really, I try to, I try to avoid the term journey because it's such a hacky term. And I agree with you. It is true, Sorry. but it does seem like a, no, 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 I get it. I say it, but then I get shit on for it. So I try not <laughs> to, but yeah, I knew. So I helped build there. I, there's a brand here in New York city that it's omnipresent in the raw vegan food space called juice press. And I, helped build that company a few years ago. Uh, The owner is a friend of mine and then he sold the company and he's who I do the show with, right? And it just kind of happened accidentally, but due to my background there and me knowing I got really fat, that it was a nice, um, a nice uh, diversion or, or just a way to think about, you know, something different. And that's what I like doing. And also, really trying to force yourself to have accountability is what I think was the best part about it. Having to do the show every week and say, did you go run? Did you meditate? Did you eat right? And I try never to lie to the best of my ability. Sometimes they may fuck up the truth and make up a mistake or whatever, but I try never to lie. So if I didn't run, I'm going to tell you, I didn't run. If I ate like shit, I'm going to tell you like last night I had ice cream. I was in a bad mood. I had ice cream. I have not been able to separate myself and my emotions from food. I don't know why, but that's one of the things I've been struggling with. So I think it's a great thing. And I think a lot of people have been happy to see my, my, my foil, you know, trials and tribulations because it makes them realize that they're not alone. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. And I think it's cool too, because it's not just you're eating and you're losing weight. You've got, like you said, the, the yoga practice and the meditation, and it's like a full comprehensive, I don't want to use the word journey again, but evolution of yourself. Yeah, is, that, is, it that, is. is that better? And it started with my co-host Marcus asked me one day on a scale from one to 10, how happy are you? And this was like off air. 
I said, maybe a five, you know, maybe a six, but five or six. And he goes, well, that's not great. That's not even a passing grade. I'm like, yeah, I guess not. Because at the time, it was a year and a half ago. I mean, I guess now, right before the pandemic started, I was 60, 70 pounds overweight. I right. was, you know, tired. I was miserable and whatever. I just wasn't, you know, I had some bouts of happiness. But now, a year and a half later, it's amazing how much I was attached. That Once, once I stopped carrying around like a small child, which is basically what that was at 60 pounds of weight, and you start having more energy again, you start feeling like you can, you know, you're sleeping better. So many things were tied to that. And, it, you know, there, there is also that concept of fake it till you make it. Like if you keep pretending to be in a good mood, eventually <laughs> it starts to actually happen. Right. It's funny you said they're 50, 60 pounds, because if you think about it, like uh, you buy, the, I buy those bags of dog food and they're 50 pounds and they're so fucking big. And that's what we're talking yeah. about. That's Imagine quite carrying that all day. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like and then you wonder why your lower back hurts, why you're always tired, why you're irritable you know so and most of us me you know i know it was tied to my father passed away and was having struggles at the at the at the job and whatever at the business and you you it, for me it was coming out in food i was eating garbage and what it was and then eventually you know the the whole concept of micro changes so i was like you know if i'm not doing any push-ups let me start with one i can do one push-up if right. i'm not doing none and if i'm eating a 10 ounce steak let me go with an eight ounce steak let me just make these little changes and I started feeling a little bit better. And then I was like, all right, let's do a little bit more. Let's do a little bit more. And I had never run in my life. And then a year, a year and a half ago, last April, so not this past April, the April before, I downloaded an app called Couch to a 5K. Oh, yeah. 5K, which, you know, your fat ass is on a couch. We'll get you to run a 5K. And now this Saturday, I'm running my third half marathon, which wow, is that's crazy. Great. Yeah, that's beautiful. Good for you. Yeah. That's really Thank inspirational. You. Yeah, and it comes from little changes. And what I love to see is now my brother started running again. Three or four of my friends are running again. I've gotten tons of people who have hit me up on Instagram saying, you know, I started cycling. I started the Peloton. I started this because I posted every day whatever I'm doing because I slept like crap, but I still got up and ran. Or I was doing SDR last night. We got drunk till three in the morning and I still got up and, and did weights or whatever it is to just say that, look, we all go through it. It's just get up and do it. Maybe it wasn't the best time. Maybe I didn't lift the best weights, but I just got out there and did it. Yeah, that's your, that's pretty amazing. And it keeps you accountable too, maybe somewhat. Yeah. I said, I know it's not a logical answer to tell everyone start a health and wellness podcast, but it definitely helped me <laughs> by knowing I'm going to have to talk about it and see what's right. going on. Definitely helped me. And maybe it's not a podcast. Maybe you and your best friend, are going to start uh, taking yoga classes together. And every day, did you do it, dude? Yeah, I did it. Did you do it? Yeah, I did it. Just having that extra accountability. One of my friends, he just sends me his, his post-workout picture every day. And if he doesn't send it, I'm like, dude, where's the fucking picture? Right. You know? And then an hour or two later, I'll get the pictures. Like, oh, I did it. You know, I wasn't going to do it, but you texted me, so I did it. Right. You guilted him into it, but he got out and moved. So that's yeah. great. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, Ralph, that is all I've got. That was a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, thank I, you, I, sir. Thank you. I, I realized your shows I looked online are nice and short. Makes it easier. You know what? Yeah. And I did it because I mean, we could keep these going forever, but and I could talk to you forever. But most people I found and I'm sure you see this. The attention span is like that of a gnat. And I've when I went right. over no, like, and also the. Uh, the most listened to podcast is about 25, 30 minutes, 40 minutes in that zone. Because um, that's the general commute for work. So that's how oh, okay. people do that. I, maybe it's live. Yeah. Maybe live it's different because it's you got a different vibe. But since they're recorded, I have found the ones that go over yeah. like right in what you said, anything over like 20, 25 minutes, yeah. the listenership goes down pretty quickly. So anyway. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Believe me. It's I appreciate living, it, my friend. Yes. I appreciate you taking the time. It was a pleasure talking to you. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Hopefully we'll cross paths again because that was a great conversation. And we seem to run right, in the same circles. Have a great day. Take care, my friend. Yeah, See for ya. sure. Bye now. I'll be good. All right, bye. Ever wonder what a punch from Elton John feels like? Or how you cope with having turned down the chance to be in Nirvana? Or what signal Keith Richards gives when he wants you to get the hell out of his hotel room? Fans of Too Much Effie Perspective don't have to wonder, because they've heard these exact stories and a jillion others on our podcast. I'm Alex Hoffman, former tour manager for Radiohead. And I'm musician and comedy writer Alan Keller. On the TMEP show, we get guests like Nancy Wilson from Heart, 
Jeremiah Freights from the Lumineers, and Modern Family's Julie Bowen to tell us things they may have only shared with their therapist, clergy, or a TMZ stringer. So join us on Too Much Effing Perspective. That's E-F-F-I-N-G Perspective. The only podcast you crank up to 11. <laughs>